launch a new series today on the life of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at five specific pillars by which he built his life upon. We concluded last week a series on the topic of faith, and we learned that Jesus is a great model of faith for us. In fact, Jesus is the best model in the entire Bible about faith, okay? And here's why. Jesus trusted God enough to do what he said to do. Remember this, faith is what? Faith is trusting God enough to do what he said. Come on, say it. Faith is trusting God enough to do what he said. Come on, trusting God enough to do what he said. That's what faith is. And Jesus is the best picture in the Bible of someone who trusted the Father enough to do what he said to do. Now, I'm going to give you five things these next five weekends straight from the life of Jesus Christ pillars of his life, and I'm going to ask you to do all five of these things. Now, just so you know, next week is fasting. I'm preparing myself for that right now, mentally. How do I get there? Because this big boy likes to eat. So just like today's topic is prayer, next week is fasting, and we're going to look at these five pillars all found in Matthew chapter 6. Go real fast to Matthew chapter 6 in your Bible, and we see these pillars of his life, okay? Here they are. Here's all five. Praying, fasting, giving, trusting, honoring. All are right here in Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 6. Matthew 6 has five things. Praying, everybody say praying. Come on, say fasting. Say giving. Say trusting. And say honoring. These are fabrically woven into his life. They're the backdrop of everything he does. These are all five present. We're going to break them all down one by one, but know this, Jesus lived these things all the time. You can almost always find him praying. You can find him fasting, not his entire life. He did eat, by the way. I had a person last night say, are we going to do a 40-day church fast? I said, no, we can do 40 days. I can't go four days out food. I've got a big boy i got to eat. And so, but we'll, we'll do something together and try to help us process how he lived his life. So Jesus was often uh, found teaching on giving. He was a giver. He gave his life. Uh, Jesus trusted the Father. He was very honoring. So this is really his DNA. This is who he was, and he models this for us, and we want to be more like Jesus. Who wants to be more like Jesus? Hand up high. Come on, say, that's me. You can do that. Here we go. We understand God through faith, right? We know God by faith. Well, without his word, how do we have faith? So watch this close. We understand God through his word, and we have communion with God through a thing called prayer. Prayer is the first pillar of Jesus' life. Jesus loved to pray. Now, when we know the word of God, we know who we're praying to. If I don't know the word, I cannot know who I'm praying to because this is his revelation to us. This maps out who he is. And as I know this book here and pray this book here, I now know who I'm praying to. And it's important to know who you're talking to. I get texts on my phone often from people I don't have the number in my, I don't have their number in my phone. And they'll just text and make a comment or ask a question. I almost come back and go, who is this? Who this? I don't know who this is. And so if I don't know who I'm talking to, it impacts how I talk. Uh, now, the people I know the closest and the people that are in my life all the time and I talk to on a regular basis, I have their name in my phone. The goal for us in praying is to know who God is because that impacts your prayer life. And watch this close. If we don't know who God is, our prayers become borrowed prayers or learned prayers. And what I mean by that is, you can only pray, now I lay me down to sleep so many times in a lifetime. You can only, God bless us food, amen, so many times. Prayer needs to come from a rehearsal state to a reflection state on who God is. And if we don't know the word of God, my prayers become borrowed prayers. Hey, I heard, heard of God praying the other day. Man, he was good. He, had, he spoke fluent King James he kept saying, these and thou's and dust and thouest and liest and standeth and walketh and, and everythingeth. He was so good at what he's praying at, and I want to pray like he does. That may not work for you. 
So you have to know who God is lest you spend your life borrowing someone else's prayers. Now, having said that, if you're, if you're just new to prayer, borrow all you like because you have to get the ability to learn how to pray. But the longer you pray, the more you come off of someone else's prayer, and the more you come into your own way of talking to your God who knows you personally. And that's how prayer works for us. Now, when we keep the Word of God in our life through prayer, it keeps us praying in the truth, Okay. Truth is scripture. The Bible's truth, okay? And that keeps our prayers on a sanctified state versus a selfish state. It's very easy to pray a selfish prayer all the time. Prayer can quickly become about you and not about God. And prayer should be about God, not about you. And that's why you have to have the Word of God, because this helps you learn to pray. Who's got your Bible close by? Hold your Bible high. If it's on your phone, hold your phone high. Come on, real fast. Hold it up in the air real fast. Here we go. Say, this is, come on, say, this is my Bible. It teaches me how to pray. Learn this book. It will impact your prayer life significantly. Every time you pray to God. Now, go real fast to Matthew chapter 6. Here we go. While you're turning, here's the last thought for you. If we get to Matthew 6. We have to know the word of God to know the will of God. This is his will. Prayers prayed outside the word of God will never fit into the will of God. So we have to pray from his word. A few weeks ago, I put on Facebook just a, I was stirring the pot. <sighs> I do that time and time again. And uh, I put on Facebook, God will never send somebody else's spouse an answer to your prayers. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard as a pastor, Lord, Pastor, I've been praying for a wife, and that's her. No, that's somebody else's wife. God is not going to divorce that family to give you an answer to prayer. And then I got this big dialogue, lots of talk and lots of private messages. And man, there was some hate about that conversation. My point is this, God never violates his will to answer your prayers. And you have to know the will of God to pray, to pray the will of God. And you have to know the word of God, pardon me, to pray the will of God. You have to get this in the right order because God doesn't violate his will to answer your prayers. Uh, now, life happens and things take place, and I get that, but my point is you can't pray a prayer, God, I pray he would lose his job so I could have it. What, what, I mean, what are you thinking? Lord, I just pray that, 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 that I can uh, um, pray that I can sue somebody and make lots of money, God. What? No, that, that's not how this works. Don't pray outside the word of God because you'll miss the will of God, learn the word of God, and then pray the word. You're always in the will of God. If you pray the word of God, you're always in the will of God. Everybody say, if I pray, come on, if I pray the word of God, I'm in the will of God. There you go, Matthew 6, here we go. Verse 1, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Verse 2, therefore, when you do a charitable deed... Do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. As surely I say to you, they have their reward. Verse 3. But when you do a charitable deed, watch the progression here. Do, it, um, do not let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Okay? That your charitable deed may be done in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you. Now, first of all, we're talking about prayer today, but this starts the conversation. And the issue here is not that you can't let people see what you do. The issue here is don't do it so people can see on purpose. That's what this is about. I'm not saying you can't do a nice thing for somebody in public or be recognized. It's not that at all. But what it's saying is don't do it for the purpose of recognition because there is your reward and not in heaven. And who wants to get the reward in heaven and not on earth? Come on now. I want my rewards up there, not just here. Keep reading verse 5. It says, and when you pray, everybody say when you pray. Not if you pray, but when you pray. You shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues on the street corners that they may be seen by men. Assured I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, 
And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. Watch this close. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, here it is again. Do not use vain repetitions, vain repetitions, learn prayers, rehearse prayers, vain repetitions, vain repetitions, as the heathen do. Everybody say heathen. As the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of. What's the next word? Before. Before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray our Father who is in heaven, holy or hallowed be your name. Jesus gives us here what we call often the Lord's Prayer, which is just a prayer template. But before he gets to the Lord's Prayer, as we call it, he gives us what I call the proper mindset of prayer. And we're going to look today at mostly the beginning parts of Matthew 6, not even get to the Lord's Prayer portion, but really focus on how we should approach God in prayer and what the mindset should be because that's what Jesus showed us from his life. He gave us a proper perspective on the topic of prayer and how to approach the Father. Now, one of the main pillars of Jesus' life was prayer. In fact, in Mark's gospel, we see the picture of Jesus performing great miracles. This is, I think, in chapter 1. And he's performing these great miracles. And, and, and then the night comes down, and he goes to bed, and he wakes up early the next morning. He slips off to pray. You could always find Jesus praying. He was always looking for a place where he could get away by himself and talk to the Father who was in heaven. Here we see in this very first part of the scripture, Matthew's gospel, we see what I call the secret to prayer. Who would like to know the secret to prayer? Who who would like, I have a secret for you. Come on, put your hand up high. All right, here we go, real fast. The secret to prayer is secret prayer. I know that's deep stuff right there. You're man, I'm glad. That's that's powerful, Marty. Thanks for sharing that today. And, And here's why. What we do that no one sees is a bigger part of our life than what people really see. Let me give you a graph. Look at this real fast on the screen. Look at this graph. Our prayer life needs to be greater in the private side than in the public side. But for many of us, we want the bigger public prayer and the lesser private prayer. We, we want to pray when people can see it, but be silent in our homes. We want to pray when folks are looking, but if it's just us and God, we're just too busy to get there. And when you look at this little graph on the screen, the idea behind this picture image for us today is to recognize it's easy for me to have my outer man look like a mighty prayer warrior. I can speak fluent King James. I say all the right stuff. But listen, if my prayer life is not bigger in my private life than my public life, I'm not really connecting to God. Because I'm doing to be seen by men and not to relate to God. Uh, We've been doing a different uh, approach to our services the last few months. We've been having our people from our church family do our our announcements to help you know what's going on. Because apparently we don't read the bulletin, don't check the website, don't look at Instagram and social media. So we're going to tell you what's going on because no one else reads anything else going on around here. We're trying to help you as a church. And so we have folks who volunteer to do that, and they do a great job. Weren't the Gambles great today doing the announcements for us? Come on, big hand for the Gambles this morning. They do a great job of that. And and, and I've been reaching out to people, hey, would you like to do the announcements? And by the way, anybody can do this. If you want to participate, if you would like to, just let us know. We'd love to have you on the stage. We can all gawk at you. And I've noticed this in my exchange with people when I say, hey, would you like to do the announcements? They go, oh. In front of people, on the stage, talking, I don't want to do that. I mean, I mean, talking in front of people is one of people's greatest fears, right? It's, it's death and then, and then public speaking, which means you'd rather be in the coffin than the guy talking over the guy in the coffin. You'd rather be dead yourself and doing the service for the person. And I think about this because by nature, we don't want to be publicly uh, uh, noticed in our prayer, especially I watch us even here. We do the prayer time at the front, and many people, I know you have needs. 
Because you tell me, you email me, you text me, you message me, you catch me in the foyer. But then we do the prayer time and no one wants to move. Let me shepherd you for a second. When we do the prayer time, get up here. You need prayer. I need prayer. There's not a week that goes by I don't text one of my mentors or one of my overseers or one of my pastor colleagues and don't say, hey, I need, I need prayer in this area of my life. Pray for this. Because I need prayer. Let me help you today. You need prayer. If Jesus needed to pray, and he was the son of God, which is pretty good status in my opinion, how much more do you need to pray? And how much more should we receive prayer? So we look at this, we see the story of Jesus talking about prayer in Matthew's gospel. And really what he does for us is he takes us here on a journey of the, 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 the framework or the mindset of prayer, and then he gives us a template on how to pray. Having said that, the prayers we pray in the silence of our souls make up the substance of our life. Learn to pray when it's just you and God. Learn to pray when everything else is quiet. You say, Marty, what do I pray for? Anything. Learn to talk to God like there's someone sitting right across from you. Learn to talk to the sky. Learn to talk in your heart. Learn to vocalize and verbalize out loud like I'm talking to Josh. That's how I pray. Learn to talk like I'm talking to Jeff. We're just having a conversation. There's no one there because my God's everywhere, but I'm talking just like I was looking at a person. That's prayer. And let your soul begin to unravel before God. If you read the Psalms, the Psalms are great, are, are great looks at prayer because the psalmist spent half his time on the run wondering if God had forgotten him or not. I mean, I love that. God, are you anywhere? They're about to kill me. Where are you right now? Are you going to come through again? Because I feel awful alone by myself down here. I, I love the Psalms. They're just great. It's like a roller coaster of life. <laughs> God, you're great. God, you're gone. God, you're awesome. Where are you? You left me. You abandoned me. You loved me. You died for me. All, it's just like it's some, some of y'all's life, right, with your spiritual walk. Learn to pray and let your soul just pour out. Let who you are when no one's there really become true to your prayer life, and let God hear what's going on in your life. Now, Jesus, what he does for us in these portions of Scripture, he brings up what I call some tension points when it comes to our mindset of how we approach prayer. And here they are real fast. We're going to break these down. Here they are. Number one, it's our piety versus humility. Piety versus humility. Number two is the priority of prayer. Jesus infers that we should pray often. How often do we pray? Number three, we see the tension between our prosperity and our dependency. I would, I would submit to you today that, that probably the biggest hurdle we have as people nowadays in first world American culture is that our prosperity has taken prayer off the table for us as a necessity. Because, I mean, how much better could life be? I mean, isn't everything great? And we tend to look at prayer more when we have a demand versus just a relationship. Now, in that thought process, here's a couple thoughts about prayer before we get to breaking those three things down. First of all, don't pray because God's useful to you. Pray because you understand your Heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask. Don't pray because you could use some prayer. I have people say, hey, Marty, I could use prayer here. Well, we, we could all use prayer. But let's pray because we know who God is. Pray not because you need him, but because you know him. That's why you pray. Jesus just wanted to talk to his dad. He just wanted to talk to the father. He just wanted to commune with the father. He just wanted to hang out and just share life. You know, one of the reasons that David the psalmist is such an articulate writer of scripture is because he spent many nights looking at the skies and seeing the wonder of God. Looking at creation, looking at the valleys, looking at nature, looking at the animals, looking as a shepherd boy would at anything around him, and he could see and he could smell and he could taste the presence and the power of God every day of his life. And that's why he's a great writer of the scripture for us, because he communed with God. People that commune with God because they know God live a different life. If your prayer life is limited to just here, you're missing who God is. 
if your word life is limited just to hearing the services or the verse of the day on, on, on you version, you're missing the real truth of knowing who God is. If your worship life is only what you do in the services and not by yourself, you're missing the true worship of our creator. You got to get the private life bigger than the public life. Because that's where you begin to experience who God really is. Pray not because you need help, but pray because you know he's worthy of our prayers. He's the Almighty. He's the creator of all things. Let's break down real fast these three areas. The first one, the piety versus humility tension. And one of them I just mentioned to you a moment ago, because for many of us, we don't think of it this way, but when we have a need and we don't bring it to our Father, that really is a point of arrogance for us. Let me ask you this question in the house. How many of you in the house, how, how many, who are my dads? If you're a father or grandfather, put your hand up high just real fast. How many of you today, dads, would want to know if your kid had a need? You, you, would, you would care to know. You're like, they tell me all the time all that they need. Now, I mean, I'm talking like real needs, not like, hey, I need more money. I'm talking like if they were sick or hurting or broken or being taunted or being affected by something, you'd want your kid to come and say, Dad, I got a problem. If that's true for us as earthly, sinful flesh beings, how much more does God want to hear us come to him with our real life moments? Jesus showed up in one of the great prayers of all time in Gethsemane, and he was broken, and he was saying, Father, if there's any possibility, I'm, my soul is sick, my soul is broken, I'm pouring out to you. If there's any chance at all, if there's any plan B, I'm all in favor of it, but if it's not, I'm going to submit to your plan. See, there's a part of us that we want to sit back and the prayer time happens and we want to just kind of sit there and stare because we don't want to come across as people who need anything from God. Listen to me, we all need God. And there's a difference in being a needy people and having a need for God. And let me encourage you today, don't ever be ashamed or withdrawn to say, I need prayer in my life. I need wisdom. I need counsel. I need instruction. I need direction. You'll be shocked how God can speak through people. The tension here we see is that some people come to God with all these great scripts of prayer. And it's not the script of our public prayer that makes a difference, but the sincerity of our private petitions that impact our walk with God. It's not how good you can speak it here. It's how good you can share it and pour it out behind the scenes. It's can you go to a private place? Jesus, Jesus was often viewed as going off to a secluded place to pray. And by the way, a plug here for Jerusalem. If you ever get a chance to go to Israel, it's a game changer. And you'll go to the places where Jesus prayed. They're still there, by the way. And you can go to the garden area. You can go to the wilderness temptation area. You can go be in the places where he confronted people, dealt with people, and talked to his father. You can stand right there. To me, that's pretty cool. Pray like Jesus prayed. Jesus told them here, don't pray like the religious folks. Don't pray where you use all your great words and, and vain repetitions like the heathen hypocrites do. He says, your father knows what you need before you ask. See, the second tension is so clear too. It's, it's the prayer priority. He often said four different times in this text, he didn't say if you pray, he said when you pray. There is an assumption in the scripture that Christians and Christ followers pray. That's assumed. It's assumed that we understand that we got to talk to our Father. Now, I know we're good at praying when we have a need, but are you, are you good at praying when life is going great for you? It's easy to pray when you're headed to the hospital, but do you pray when you're headed to the bank to cash that big check you just got? In fact, the Bible is clear to us that, that the prosperity is more of a threat than our poverty when it comes to us and God. So we see this tension develop for us, this idea of the priority of prayer. Jesus, time and time again, is seen in the Scripture as breaking away from the masses and going off by himself and saying, Father, I've got to talk to you, and here's why. When we don't pray, it shows a self-sufficiency. It shows a self-reliance on that we're good enough without God. Prayer tells me I need God in my life. God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to raise a family. I don't know how to be a husband. I don't know how to lead a church. I don't know how to do this, this, and this. God, I need help. That's how you have to pray. 
I don't know how to open a company. I don't know how to make the sale. I don't know how to do this deal today, God. I'm not sure what's next on my agenda. Lord, Lord, just I need you to guide my life. Learn to pray and ask God to speak to your life and direct life. You'll be shocked how real God can be. I've told my sons more than once in their lifetime to talk to God. I've always said, boys, God can talk to an 18-year-old kid. God can answer the prayer of a 17-year-old boy. God can talk to teenagers. God can talk to students. God can talk to young adults. God doesn't have an age requirement. And know this, know this. We have a Father who knows what we need before we ask. Let me get to the third tension point we see in the scripture of this story that Jesus maps out for us in Matthew chapter 6. It's the tension between our prosperity and dependency. I need my friend real fast. Where's my, where's my buddy at? Come up here, Mr. Overton. I'm going to use you for a second today. This guy did a great job last night. By the way, he is single. If you're a young lady, this is your guy right here. He is unemployed, however, so that is a factor uh, in marriage life. Remember this, we have a Father who knows what we need when, before. Everybody say before. Now watch this real fast. I'm going to pick you up. Is that okay? Can I pick you up? Don't sit down too fast. This is the picture of us and God in prayer. Now, if he's here and I'm God and he's my child, I did this last night my son Landon said, why don't you pick me up? I said, I can't, I can't pick you up. I had to get the Overton kid. I can't pick up a Sloan kid. Sloans are too thick. <laughs> How many of you think that if I'm God and this is my child, I will know all he needs right here? That if he's this close to me, I know his needs. I know if he's hurting. I know if he's lost. I know if he's lonely. I know if he's sick. I know if he's hungry. I know him right here because look how close we are. See, when we stay in our Father's arms, he knows our needs before we ask. The problem for us is we tend to live, go stand over there real fast. We tend to live this far away from God and then only come back when we have a need. By the way, when he is here, we can just hang out together. I remember as a dad raising my sons, one of the best days when they were little babies was just kind of holding them up here and just patting their back. Can't do that anymore. They're too big. That's a great sight, right, to see a father holding his child and just kind of holding the baby. And that's us and God. Thank you, man. Did a great job. Big hand for my friend today, Chandler. He did a great job for us. We need to begin our prayers with a clear awareness that God knows our needs before. Everybody say before we ask. Now, why am I saying this to you? Let me just throw it to you this way. How often are our prayers more about our needs than they are our relationship with him? How often have our prayer life just kind of turned a corner of the needy street and we only go to God when we have a need? Now, if you're a parent, you get this because there's times in life as a parent that you feel like your kids only call or text when they have a need. That's, that's just true. That's just how life was. I was the same way. I, my parents, when I was growing up, they were very much on a usury level. How can I use you today? I'm happy to do so. But it's a great change when the relationship begins to switch to not, I need you, but I value you and love you. And that's a game changer. And so our prayer life can often become this needy-based conversation because we live so far from God's arms. It's not just about touching his face and being with him and drawing close to God. It's about my needs. And if I were to do a survey and just to get you to be honest with, it, with us today, I would suggest that many of us, our, our prayer life consists of our Christmas lists, our needs and wants and desires. And have very little to do with, God, I'm just so amazed by who you are. I woke up today and looked outside and thought, my goodness, there's a, an amazing God. Look at the sun. Look at the clouds. Look at the creation. That's what the psalmist prayed. And so I want to challenge you to turn your prayer life from a need-based dialogue to reflection on who God is. 
And I promise you this, if you stay close enough to God's arms, he knows your needs before you ask. That's what he promises us. And Jesus told us, he said, listen, these hypocrites, they're coming to prayer time and they're just banging their chests and doing this and this and saying these things and they don't realize their father already knows all this stuff. Now, am I saying you can't pray for needs? No, pray all you need to, but hear me. Let's turn the corner in in our life of prayer to where it's more about who God is and less about who we are. Let's pray so that we know more about his love for us, his his gift of salvation for us, his, his mercies, his grace, his love. Every day is brand new for our life. Let's pray more and thank God more for that than anything else we do. And if you live there, you'll be shocked how your needs get less and less. There's an old school song we would sing back in the day, Turn Your Eyes Toward Jesus. It's an old school tune. And there's a part of the song that kind of just says, the things on earth grow strangely dim in light of your glory and grace. As we begin to look upon God and who God is, the stuff down here gets a whole lot smaller. You ever float on an airplane and realize how stuff on earth gets real small the higher you go? Just think about that for a second. How the things that trouble us here get smaller the higher we go in God. Jesus gives us a picture and a warning in Luke's gospel on greed. I mentioned it a moment ago in the offering segment, but hear me today. I think our prosperity has killed our dependency upon God. We have so much, we have more than enough. So what is there to pray for? And before you know it, that affects our passion for prayer because we've already got all life together. And we have to realize that our provision is contained within the Father's will. And he knows our needs before we ask those things. And watch this, like Jesus prayed, how often do you pray for submission versus provision. How often do you pray, God, help me have a submitted heart to your word. God, help me forgive those I hate. God, help me love my enemies. God, help me restore that relationship. God, help me do this. How often have you heard the word of God preached to you in a service like this, and you hear the word of God preached, you go, I'm just going to go home. I'm not doing that anyway. Versus go pray about it. And pray honestly, God, I don't want to do what the preacher just said to do. I don't want to do it at all. I don't, I don't know if I like that. I think he's on bad pizza. Something's wrong with that. I disagree. Okay, pray through it. Pray. Talk to God. Pour your soul out, and you'll be shocked how God can speak to you. You know, when you're talking to somebody, they can talk back to you, and they can share with you. When you talk to God, God can speak to you. But let prayer become the way you talk to God. Jesus, the first pillar of his life was prayer. He loved to get alone with just him and the Father. Just talk about life. We don't have all he prayed, but I'm just telling you, based upon the life he lived and the the story of his life, what we do know, I can just tell you this, he talked to his dad on a regular basis. He just broke away. I just said, well, here's what's going on down here. I'm over here. In Capernaum, just chilling out. Life is good. Learn to pray just by talking to God and sharing your life, okay? Know this, he knows your need before you ask. Don't come to God because you deserve it. Come because he's worthy of it. Don't come because you're good. Come because he's good. And when you pray, let's turn our prayers more just about who he is and not so much our needs every day. Don't let your prayer life become consumed with your needs. Learn to pray this book here. Jesus quoted all from the book of Deuteronomy. That was his main go-to default text in his days. That was his revelation. That's what he quoted in the wilderness temptation. That's, that was his book. That was his go-to. Get you a go-to book in the Bible. Quote that in prayer all the time. Learn the scriptures that teach you how to pray. You say, Marty, how do I stay in God's arms? Well, real simple. You just stay in close proximity. You stay in worship. You stay in the word. By the way, this right here keeps you somewhat in God's arms. We're the body of Christ. So being part of the family keeps you in the God's presence in God's arms. That's why you should come to church as much as possible because that puts you back in God's care. Father, I thank you today for your word. 
I thank you for the access of prayer. You're certainly worthy of our prayers today, God. And may we take the model of the life of Jesus and may we live out before you every day just the practice of solitude, getting alone with you and sharing our life from the core of our soul. Let us relate to you in reality of who we are and where we're at in life. And let our prayer life, God, turn today toward your greatness and your glory and your majesty and not just our daily needs. You know our needs and you take good care of us. We thank you today. Jesus, name. now right there with your head bowed, eyes still closed. Just ask the Holy Spirit of God what you should take as a next step off of this message today. What is your next step? How will you incorporate prayer in your daily living? Every day. Prayer about who he is. Prayer from the word. Prayer that changes everything. Let God's Spirit speak to you today briefly. Holy Spirit of God, speak to our hearts, our next steps. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.